David Bebbington, welcome to Apollo Watered. Not at all. It's nice to be here. Are you ready for the Fast Five? Uh, yes, I've been forewarned, so I'm as ready as I can be. <laughs> now, I, because you were a guest, going to be a guest on this show, I announced this to our Facebook community that you were coming on, and if I have any questions, or if they had any questions for you. And one of our listeners, Andrew, says... <laughs> In lieu of your famous name and the quadrilateral that draws its name from you, his question was a bit tongue-in-cheek. What is your favorite quadrilateral? A rhombus, an <laughs> isosceles, a trapezium, a parallelogram, a square, or etc. I love variety in quadrilaterals. And indeed, a book that I had published a couple of years ago has assorted quadrilaterals on the cover in different colors. That is the ideal. I believe that quadrilateral is universalizable. <laughs> okay, that's, <laughs> I was not expecting that answer. I can honestly say that I wasn't expecting that. Now you travel a lot. You've been to the US quite a bit. What is the one food you like to eat that is not as good in the UK? Beef. I go to Texas. And so Texas provides superb quality beef which is always tender and always sweet. When I come back to the UK, I refuse to eat beef for six months because it will not be anything like real beef. <laughs> I like that one. Um, all right, but being a part of the UK, being a, I mean, being a citizen, what do you consider, having traveled, is the best part of being a citizen of the UK? That's the third question. Well, I really like having something that you don't have in the United States, and that is a standard policy for rear windshield wipers. In the UK, every car has a rear windshield wiper, so you can see even when it's raining through the back window. In America, yes, some cars do, but some don't. And I was once caught in a appalling rainstorm in North Carolina in December when it was dark. I could not see at all. I was not, totally unfamiliar with the road. I nearly had three crashes, and that was the result of the absence of this necessary feature of modern life. Why America hasn't had it, I have the foggiest idea, but it hasn't, and it should. <laughs> <laughs> okay, being a historian, if there is one historical figure that you could have tea with, not from biblical times, who would it be and why? It would be William Ewart Gladstone, about whom I've written quite a lot, um, because on one occasion he was at a party and people said, now let us all contribute who and when we would most like to have been with in the whole of history, the very question you just asked me. And he said he'd love to have been in the company of Homer. And then he suddenly realized that he really ought to have suggested somebody from biblical times and he retracted shamefacedly that's true of gladstone and gladstone was uh, a noble person who, who was capable of retracting an error in answer to your question <laughs> i have to say this is one of the most entertaining fast fives and insightful fast fives i've ever done but and and this question uh, actually is loaded because of what we just spoke about in our pre-show walkthrough if your life were to be a book, what would be the title and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is not a hypothetical question because, <laughs> as you well know, my life has been written. There is a published academic biography of me, weirdly, which I'm sure shouldn't exist, but does, and it's written by my wife. She published it with an academic publisher, Whip from Stock, 20, in 2015, and it actually discusses my background, my origins, and how that shaped my life. And because one of my books was called Patterns in History, she called the biography A Patterned Life. So that is available, and I'm delighted to try to promote sales of my wife's book. <laughs> is, is it strange? I mean, how often in history has a spouse written a biography of their spouse? And was she fair or was she, uh, I mean, <laughs> I have so many questions. 
my my wife is a very judicious person and a very um, diplomatic person, and therefore she managed to write about me. I think without being hagiographical, without being silly, but bringing out um, facets of my life which most of them I'm very happy to, for people to know about. Um, intriguingly, I have never yet tracked down any instance of a wife writing the biography of her husband, as my wife has done, until he is safely dead. <laughs> OK, well, let's transition. Let's hear your biography. You know, a lot of people know who you are. At least they know the quadrilateral that bears your name. But when you came to faith, where you grew up, and some of your family story, and how you became a historian. Okay. I was born in 1949 in Nottingham in the English North Midlands. I went with my parents to a Brethren Assembly. That's the so-called Primeth Brethren when they were, uh, when I was young. And found its atmosphere intriguing, not least because of the silence. But then my parents moved to a Baptist church, a very conservative Baptist church, when I was nine. And a year later at that church, I was converted uh, from a, after a woman preacher's sermon. And of course, brethren did not then at all approve of women preaching. So that was anomalous. But it was real. I knelt down at the side of my bed and prayed a prayer of commitment. And although I was only 10, um, I think it was real. I think it stuck. And although I've questioned it in retrospect, I think there has been a continuity of a sort of Christian experience ever since. So uh, I, I was a, a Christian. I, I didn't become a member of my Baptist church as I now think I jolly well should have done. I don't like separating conversion from baptism and church commitment. But I, I was baptized uh, when I was 18, just before going to university. And that was a matter of serious reflection. And that was, as it were, a declaration of where I stood. And at university thereafter, uh, I was very active in the Baptist Society, the Robert Hall Society at the University of Cambridge. The school that I had been to, Nottingham High School, was a superb school. It was what in, in England is called a public school, and therefore, of course, is a private school, a splendid paradox. Um, it was totally independent of the state, but it had begun as the town grammar school in 1513 and therefore had free places for some people from the local state primary schools. So I got a free place, and I therefore had a marvellous education with quite excellent teachers, most of them, there were, there were exceptions. There was the maths teacher against whose door desks were piled up every lesson, and we could hear them from the next door room. But, but that apart, almost all the teachers were really good, and they gave me a very good education, which made it quite natural for my friends and me to go on either to Oxford four people went there, or Cambridge, 27 people went there, which was obviously a very sensible ratio. At that school, I had good history teachers, and I became more and more interested in history. I'd actually been interested in the subject even before I went to my high school. When I was nine at my primary school, we had to do a project. And so my wise primary school teacher encouraged me to do something on ancient history. So I wrote a book called A History of the Ancient World with which is incorporated classical mythology in four volumes. And it was indeed 120 pages and has footnotes. So in a sense, I was already online to be a historian from primary school, but clearly the, the rather superior teaching at my high school helped enormously. So I went up to Cambridge to read history and um, Cambridge history at that time was also extremely good. I was a very much appreciative beneficiary of lots of distinguished historians. Some of them, I confess, um, more congenial than others. And it was natural, therefore, to go on to do a history PhD, which can be done straight away without a master's degree intervening in those days. I have to say, however, that the history was 
of a particular type. It, I was up at university as an undergraduate from 1968 to 1971, and that was the peak of the time, certainly in Britain, in some measure, I think, in the States too, when economic history was very much the vogue and when Marxism was very much an influence. So that on the right wing, there were people who said that political events are determined by economics, and the Marxists said exactly the same thing, but they had a very different view of what the proper economic relationships were and therefore how politics was, was determined. And so people were influenced, were, were keen on influencing undergraduates towards economic determinism of various types, which marginalized ideas in general and religion in particular as influences. Jeffrey Elton, who was a very distinguished Tudor historian, came into a lecture on one occasion, said, we'll talk about the English Civil War today. And his line was, well, of course, we now know that religion had nothing to do with its origins. Well, that, that is a quite extraordinary statement by the standards of previous generations or subsequent generations. It is now recognised that religion was a major, possibly the major factor behind the English Civil War. But at that time, that was not so. Hence, this historian who was a Christian and wanted to explore the relationship between Christianity and history, went off to the theology faculty and listened to very good lectures there on the history of ideas in relation to the Christian past. So I got a lot of my history, paradoxically, from theology, and the two naturally melded. Even before I went to university, I had been inspired to, guided towards, writing a history of the church where I'd been converted. And it was only 100 years old, in our terms, trivial, of course. Um, but it made me explore the past of a Baptist church in North Nottingham from the 1870s to the 1970s. And that made me do oral history, but also try to work out the relationship of that church to public affairs and therefore to mainstream politics. And so I decided that if I wanted to do a PhD and was able to, I should move on to the relationship between Nonconformity, including Baptist, Congregationalists, and Methodists, very strong in the late 19th, early 20th century, and politics, because there was a big gap there. There was no published book in that field. So that's what I went to do my PhD on, the nonconformist conscience. That's how I became a historian. I want to talk about your book, actually, and it's a little it's a little bit older now, The Dominance of Evangelicalism. And I've known you've written several books, but I was especially drawn to this one because, number one, it was a history of evangelicals that InterVarsity Press had done. But also the subtitle are two of my favorite characters in this period of time. Actually, this is one of my favorite periods of time within church history, The Age of Spurgeon and Moody. And I, of course, I went to Moody, so I read a lot about D.L. Moody. Actually, it was me reading about D.L. Moody that made me want to go to Moody. I didn't even know that Moody existed until I read his biography. And Spurgeon has always been a huge fan. As a matter of fact, in an in homage, I named my dog Spurgeon. But why is this period of time so informative, or how does it shape how we understand evangelicalism today? And I know that's a very broad question, but I think it's a very, very important one. Okay, let me begin with those two figures. Um, Spurgeon was undoubtedly the greatest preacher of his generation in the whole Anglo world and probably in the whole world. Indeed, that opinion was shared. For example, the Serbian Orthodox Church, Serbian Orthodox Church, commanded that all its clergy should preach sermons by Spurgeon at least once a year. Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah, but they did. And Spurgeon's influence was very, very widespread. Um, when I go to the States and look at seminary and university libraries, I usually find vast arrays of Spurgeon titles still, not just his sermons, but his other writings. So his influence has lasted, and that's that's remarkable. Um, Moody was, uh, in some senses, a disciple of Spurgeon. He greatly respected him. He admired his preaching skills. He shared much of his theological perspective. Moody was not as emphatic a Calvinist as Spurgeon, but he was not far from it. 
Um, Moody, of course, is celebrated as a, a traveling preacher, an evangelist, a revivalist, and was so, and therefore his influence extended over a very wide area in the United States, but also in Britain. The biography of Moody, the standard biography, which is a good one, a very scholarly biography, is called uh, The American Evangelist. But he wasn't just American. He, he was also British and extremely influential in Britain. When I did a, an article for the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, the standard reference work for biographies in Britain, um, I concluded that he probably, Moody probably, was the most important cultural import from America to Britain before Hollywood. And I still believe that. So Moody also has a very wide influence and those two figures did an enormous lot to shape the evangelicalism that followed. However, I would also argue that history is not just created by individuals, which it is, they play their part, but also by cultural forces. And I think the cultural forces that came into play in the West during the 19th century, and especially in the second half of the 19th century, helped determine how religion developed in the 20th century, and in some measure still develops in the 21st. In particular, I think the evangelical movement was impacted in a really big way by the legacy of the Enlightenment. Now, traditionally, it's, it's been held that the Enlightenment was a secular and in some ways secularizing movement and hostile to religion in general and to biblical faith in particular. I do not share that view. It is true that there were some Enlightenment figures, especially in the 18th century, especially in France, Voltaire, for example, who was very critical of revealed religion. But in the 18th century and still in the 19th century, a large number of evangelicals shared most of the intellectual premises of the Enlightenment about the way in which investigation is the key to acquiring knowledge the way in which one can look to the future for advances in human skills, and many other assumptions were shared between more secular thinkers and evangelical Christians, which is partly why the evangelical movement grew so rapidly in the early 19th century. And those assumptions were still very widespread in the later 19th century. For example, most evangelical Christians in the late 19th century were post-millennialists. They believed, yes, there would be a millennium in the future, but they believed that history was gradually moving towards the millennium, so things were getting better. That was because the gospel was spreading in the Anglo world, but beyond it through the missionary movement too. And in the wake of the spread of the gospel, things were getting better in every sphere. One of my favorite articles is from the General Baptist magazine in England from 1854, which said that, uh, in the future, by the year 2016, actually, there will be huge progress. And by that date, there will be an end, not just to war, but also to taxes. That has not happened, but that was the, the confident belief. There was optimism about the future. And post-millennialism is optimism about the future. That, that is closely aligned with the expectations of the Enlightenment. And that was dominant in the late 19th century and led on in some measure to the social gospel. And the social gospel was not originally something hostile to the evangelical movement either. It was largely rooted in it, not exclusively rooted in the evangelical movement to a large extent it was. So the, the enlightenment was a cultural force that had a major impact on the evangelical movement in the later 19th century. But so paradoxically was the movement that supplanted the enlightenment as a broad cultural movement. This is the Romantic movement, which literary historians tend to date from 1790 to 1830, but it didn't stop then. Romanticism is a set of intellectual and attitudinal positions spread more widely subsequently, so that some of the greatest expressions of Romantic art come after 1830. For example, in Germany, Wagner's music is clearly romantic, but its, it's apogee is in the mid-19th century. And to take just one literary instance, 
The novels of Walter Scott were written in the early 19th century, and they are very romantic in tone, but they became much more popular in the late 19th century. So what you see in the late 19th century is a spread to a wider public of attitudes which were confined to an intellectual elite in the early 19th century, which are romantic in tone. So there is an expectation of heroes being great figures. Thomas Carlyle, the greatest English language prose writer, wrote an essay on heroes and heroism. The heroic is a very major theme in, in the romantic, in romantic discourse, and that's entered into evangelicalism. There's also a sense in which the, the past should be valued much more highly about romantics. That's evident in Sir Walter Scott's novels. He set them habitually in the past, um, Ivanhoe, for example, in the Middle Ages. So that increasingly evangelicals in the late 19th century live in a world which is conditioned by romantic attitudes. And those romantic attitudes lead them to think that it's likely that heroes are important and they, their greatest hero is Jesus Christ. And they tend therefore to think in terms of a dramatic end to the future when Jesus Christ will come. And premillennialism, is associated with that expectation of the heroic breaking in of Jesus into the history of humanity at the second coming. And also, there is a sense in which the looking to the past conditions evangelicals in the late 19th century, and they tend to think that things are not getting better as their post-millennial contemporaries supposed, but are getting worse the church is losing its fervor, the church is going into decay, and therefore only the second coming will actually put things back on course. So it's the late 19th century when there is a very widespread growth in the movement called premillennialism, and increasingly especially dispensationalism, which clearly led on to a very great deal of what happened in 20th century evangelicalism, when these beliefs spread even more widely, not least through the Schofield Bible. So culture through the Enlightenment and through Romanticism, which comes behind it and gradually attracts more and more people to its assumptions, are both at work deeply shaping evangelical religion. And that's partly what that book you just waved around. I, of course, have the British version here. This mm. can, tries to analyze what happened to the evangelical movement in part in relation to those cultural movements. So both of those figures come along and they actually shape then Christianity or evangelical Christianity in the States and in Great Britain moving forward. So what were the big shifts that they put an emphasis on that carry on even today? Spurgeon, in a sense, was defeated. Spurgeon was the champion of a traditional Puritan form of Calvinistic theology, and that was going out of popularity in the late 19th century. He also was very troubled by the rise of various broadening theological influences stemming largely from the Romantic movement. Romanticism tended to make people have less eagerness to define doctrine and more willingness to accept mistiness where doctrine previously had been. A lot of the more liberal theologians in the evangelical world, still within the evangelical world, but liberalizing in the late 19th century, were much less inclined to be definite about doctrines, most obviously the atonement, but also other doctrines too, where they were vaguer than their predecessors had been. Spurgeon was alarmed. He therefore uh, encouraged one of his um, lieutenants to write articles in the late 1880s speaking of a downgrade that was affecting the churches. And the downgrade controversy was the result within the Baptist Union. Um, Spurgeon tried to carry other Baptists with him, but he didn't. He therefore resigned from the Baptist Union. It was a great shock to his contemporaries, and that affected a broader evangelical world too, including in North America. But the split was most obviously felt within Baptist circles in Britain. Um, he left, very few people left the Baptist Union with him. In a sense, therefore, he was defeated the downgrade controversy. 
But that was the first shot across the bows in England, and there'd be already been one in Scotland, against these liberalizing theological trends of which he, I think, discerned the consequences being even more drastic negation of traditional Christian theology, theological positions. And that shot across the bows was, in a sense, one of the opening rounds in what became the fundamentalist controversies of the 1920s. They were not confined to America. They affected Britain too. They affected the whole Anglo world, much more uh, strident in the States than in Britain. But nevertheless, they did affect the world, the, the world of the evangelicals in 20th century in Britain too. And that made for a split between conservative evangelicals and liberal evangelicals. Spurgeon was, as it were, anticipating that polarization in the 20th century. Moving to Moody, Moody actually provided a theological scheme which was more acceptable than Calvinism as such to the late 19th century mind. It was a sort of generic evangelicalism, fo focusing very definitely on the atonement, uh, one of his greatest sermons was on the blood, which he preached on many occasions. And he made that the fulcrum of his system, but also um, insisted on all sorts of other aspects of the traditional evangelical body of faith, but without any distinctive angularities. And what Moody taught was the normative form of evangelical theology in the States and in Britain during the 20th century. Some people added extra positions, some Methodist evangelicals said, oh, we're Arminians, and some Reformed evangelicals said, oh, we're Calvinists, but nevertheless, they shared very largely in the standard position that Moody set out. And just like Spurgeon's sermons, Moody's sermons were read again and again and again in the 20th century, in, in particular, when a particular church found that there was no preacher coming that Sunday because the preacher had forgotten to come, then they'd have one of their deacons, one of their leaders, read a sermon by Spurgeon or Moody. So deeply influential figures in, in those terms, I think. And both of them obviously didn't make it into the 20th century. Both of them passed away, but their influence has continued on in some capacity even to today. And you yeah. said that there was this shift between the separation where you saw the fundamentalists and the liberals start to split apart in, in the United States, specifically in North America. We see it at Andover Newton, Yale, Harvard, this theology that is permeating. And then you see a response, a counter response, where those, those conservatives pull out of those liberal institutions and form their own pulling out of Princeton to form West, Westminster and then other schools like Moody Bible Institute and Wheaton College, NIAC, all of those schools that have been formulating. And you see, though, that that controversy even continues on in some form into the mid-20th century. But we've always had this idea of liberalism it, it, retooling and, and becoming. There's always that split apart between conservatives and the liberal aspect of things. You see that even to today with this idea of what some have called progressive Christianity. How is progressive Christianity related or connected to the liberal Christianity that was making its way into the late 19th century and now is showing up into the 21st century? Are there connection points? Yes, I'm sure there are. Um... I don't think one should see contemporary progressive Christianity as a single entity. I think there are lots of positions. Some people within a progressive pattern are much more uh, orthodox and others are much less orthodox. And by orthodox, I would uh, apply criteria from the early church as well as criteria from traditional evangelical teaching. However, when that's been said, there are some features of the theology of the late 19th century that was incoming and liberal in tendency, and some of the features of contemporary thinking in progressive evangelical circles that are liberal in tendency too. One that I would single out, I think, is the notion of God 
as father and father alone. Now, clearly, the scriptures do teach us that God is our father. But there's a great deal in the Bible which speaks of God in very different terms. And one of them would be as king, one of them would be as judge, many of them would uh, be relate to his rulership, his government, and uh, rather more austere and less automatically kindly qualities than are summed up by God as Father. And I think some progressive Christians of our day follow the tendencies of the late 19th century in seeing God as Father alone. That was one of the concerns that um, followers of Spurgeon had in the late 19th century. It was also a central concern at Andover. You mentioned Andover in particular in the States. There was a shift from the traditional New England theology, which went all the way back to Jonathan Edwards uh, in the 1860s, 1870s at Andover, when people repudiated that tradition, which had reigned there at a time when Andover was the largest congregational seminary in the United States. And it was replaced by an emphasis on God as father. Now, if you take God as father alone, there are also all sorts of domino effects. If God is father alone, then what do you make of the atonement? Surely, surely a father would not make his son suffer. Surely, therefore, the atonement in its traditional form can't be accepted because we can't say that God imposes the burden of sins of the world on his son. That, that just doesn't seem to make sense. And there was a strong tendency in that direction. If God is, however, a God of justice as well as love, then he can be expected to want to pursue redemption, and that must be by extreme methods, and the extreme methods may involve the giving up his, of his son to death, and the son whose will is in harmony with that of the father may be willing to suffer death. So if God is not just father but other things too, then the atonement in a more traditional form a more redeeming form, one may think, um, can, can be validated. I do believe that quite a lot of the tendencies in contemporary progressive Christianity are associated with saying, God is nothing but Father. He's always loved us. He'll continue to love us. Therefore, one can wink at sin. Therefore, one doesn't need an atonement. And therefore, key elements in the traditional evangelical understanding of the scriptures are denuded of some of their value. Now, when that's been said, I think that there needs to be a very important caveat about seeing continuity between 19th century liberalism and 21st century progressivism. There are other major cultural influences in play now. Not just the legacy of the Enlightenment, which is still with us in large measure, not just the legacy of the Romantic movement, which is still in play, but also in the late 20th century, there's been the impact on society at large, Christianity in particular, and evangelicals most particularly, of a movement which has all sorts of labels, <clears throat> sometimes called modernism, springing from the early 20th century, but that's not theological modernism. That is cultural modernism. It's the assumptions of the avant-garde artists at the start of the 20th century that one should express oneself culturally so that, for example, non-representational art in the manner of Picasso enters into the cultural mainstream at the start of the 20th century. Now, that sort of expressivism, which is the way I prefer to call it now, uh, because people were thought to need to express themselves culturally, became more and more widespread as the 20th century went on. And I think in the late 20th century, the need to express oneself impinged in a big way on the evangelical movement. One of its most obvious ways of expressing itself is through the charismatic renewal movement from the 1960s, which did say, yes, you must express yourself. That's why hands began to be raised in worship. That's why people started um, saying, I can dispense with the traditions of the elders in the evangelical movement 
for example, I don't have to uh, restrict myself uh, by being an adherent to the temperance movement. I can drink alcohol. There's nothing in the Bible which condemns it. Jesus did. So there are all sorts of shifts from the 60s onwards, that crucial decade in the history of religion in the Western world, whereby these new cultural influences associated with expressivism came into force. And I would see myself post-modernism as an intellectual construct, which is an expression of expressivism. I would see that as the intellectual content of associated with the whole expressivist trend in culture. If that's true, one should expect certain aspects of expressivism to have had an impact on progressive Christianity in the recent past. And I think that's true. So that, for example, a willingness to let people express themselves in terms of their gender identity according to their preference is a natural corollary of that view which I've labelled by that word expressivism. And I think progressive Christians in our day tend to be associated with the movement in favour of letting people express their gender identity exactly as they wish. And that, of course, is a major dividing force within Christianity in our day. Uh, in the States, it is actually dividing Methodism as we speak. The Methodist mm -hmm. Church is undergoing schism uh, so that the United Methodist Church will lose half its congregations in Texas within a 12-month period. And there are similar developments, especially within the Church of England in, in, the, 20th, in the 21st century. And though that movement, that tendency is not limited to non-evangelicals, it affects evangelicals too. So I would see, yes, continuity with the late 19th century in progressive tendencies, but also innovations. And I would largely associate these with a fresh cultural wave. The, the past that's been inhabited by evangelicals can best be understood, it seems to me, in terms of successive waves of enlightenment, romanticism, and expressivism. When you put them together and see how they mingle and interweave and are still influential in the present, you have a key to understanding how evangelicalism has changed over time. Mm. Well, let's go back for a moment just to define evangelicalism. Um, oh. and you're, you're just, I, I actually want to take your question and go further into the future, but if I do, I'm going to be remiss because I've skipped over this part that I believe is so important. You are known in many circles for creating what is known as your your quadrilateral, the Bebbington quadrilateral, something that I heard about in school. And I know that many in our audience may or may not be familiar, probably not familiar unless you're an academic. What is the Bebbington quadrilateral and why is it important for us understanding evangelicalism today? Once... When I was at Baylor University, where I've quite often visited, I was there last semester. They very kindly arranged a special dinner to mark my 60th birthday. And I was ever so grateful. And somebody would kindly made a speech and then I had to respond. And the question of the evangelical quadrilateral had been raised by the speaker. So I had to comment on that. So I had to think of the four characteristics that I have said evangelicalism stresses, hence the quadrilateral, the four stresses. And unfortunately, when I'd gone through three, I forgot the fourth. So <laughs> there's a risk, there is a risk of that happening again. <laughs> However, what the evangelical quadrilateral is, is a comment on how evangelicals have expressed their faith from the 1730s, when the movement first began, right up to the present day. And my insistence on the basis of evidence from America, Britain, and indeed throughout the rest of the world, is that evangelicalism has rested on emphasizing four characteristics. One is the Bible. The Bible is the authority for religion, but it's also the support of evangelical spiritual lives. A second is the cross. The atonement is what redeems us from slavery to sin, and the blood of the Lamb is what actually saves us. A third is conversion, 
that people are not automatically Christians, that they have to be converted to become true Christians. And the fourth is activism, that you actually express your faith in doing lots of things, spreading the gospel, certainly, and also, at most stages of evangelical history, but not always, engaging in active social concern. Now, I'd want to stress that evangelicals have been people who have emphasised those four. Other types of Protestant Christians in particular have upheld those positions, but they haven't always emphasised those points more than other points within the Church of England in the 19th century. Other Christians, whether high churchmen or broad, broad churchmen, emphasised not the atonement, but the incarnation. And that was a trend associated with the Romantic movement I've already spoken of. But that tended to take the Christian movement in Britain and elsewhere away from the evangelical priorities. But I'd want to stress, therefore, that evangelicals are people who have emphasised those four, not just held them, emphasised them. I'd also want to say that this is not really a definition. Definitions are what theologians do, and I'm not a theologian. I would call it a characterization. It is actually a description of how evangelicals have in practice been at many places at many times. Indeed, I would say in all places and in all times there have been evangelicals and they've shown these common characteristics. They've shown enormous number of other variations. And I'm fascinated by the variations, which are not least affected by the sort of cultural currents I've spoken of already. But those four elements say, here's an evangelical, here be evangelicals. But that is, as it were, a, phen a phenomenology of evangelicalism. It's saying that that's what the phenomenon has consisted of over time. And I did actually produce a couple of books a couple of years ago called The Evangelical Quadrilateral, which backs up that contention by having essays on various aspects of the movement. I'm afraid in Britain, uh, the, there are mentions of America, but most of the chapters are about Britain rather than America. And they, they point out the evidence or that characterization being valid. So I do still adhere to that notion, which has become very popular um, because other people have noticed that it reflects the evidence. If it didn't reflect the evidence, I wouldn't hold it. I'm not claiming to be the inventor of evangelicalism. I'm claiming <laughs> to be the discoverer of a phenomenon that has existed over time and over space. You mentioned that evangelicalism from the 1730s, when you talk about its origin, I don't think many in our audience have even thought about that. They don't think about how far their history goes back and where it originated from. Where do you see evangelicalism or uh, originating from? Okay, I do see evangelicalism as being a distinct phenomenon developing from the 1730s onwards, associated with what in America is normally called the Great Awakening, in Britain, the Evangelical Revival. Now, it happened in denominations which were deeply indebted to earlier Christian history, of course, and in most denominations that already existed, the Anglicans, the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, these, the, their traditions stem from the Reformation. <clears throat> but there is, as it were, a distinct change of gear in the mid 18th century. From the Reformation of the 16th century onwards, those various denominations had insisted on reformation being the priority for Christian believers, that they must reform their church order, reform their pattern of worship, so they reflected what the scriptures command. Getting churches right was their priority. From the mid 18th century onwards, beginning of the 1730s, but developing the 40s, 50s onwards, Christians who identified with the Great Awakening began to say, OK, we carry on with our Reformation emphases on church order, but we also seek revival. We want to revitalize our churches by having deep personal experience of God, 
and spreading that deep personal experience to other people too by spreading the gospel. So the impetus to spread the gospel became much more prominent. It's no accident that in the Anglo world, the missionary movement to other parts of the world is the fruit of that evangelical revival stroke Great Awakening. The first um, traditional denominations, major missionary society is founded in 1792 by William Carey, the Baptist Missionary Society. And that represents the impulse to spread the gospel, the activism I've been spoken of. Uh, that, that activism is now becomes an international phenomenon, taking the gospel not just to the those in the countries where it, the gospel was already known, but to fresh countries, in order to have revival spread elsewhere. So whereas the Reformation, Reformation had been the paradigm within which Christians operated up to the mid 18th century, evangelicals subsequently adopted revival as their chief paradigm, constantly seeking it and promoting it, not only at home, but also abroad. Therefore, there's a very distinct change of gear. Now, some historians have criticized that. Indeed, there's a whole book that was published in 19, uh, 2009, I think, having contributions by quite, quite a lot of uh, historians and theologians saying, well, no, we don't think that it only began in the mid 18th century. The evangelical movement goes right back to the Reformation. And some people who see reformed continuities from the Reformation onwards can have quite a strong case for seeing continuities right through the 18th century and onwards. And I would share the view that there is a great deal of continuity. However, other contributors to the volume said, and these are the ones I really agree with, yes, although there's that continuity, there is also a great deal of discontinuity and there is novelty in the, the quest for revival in the, in the 18th century. And I think that the clinching argument which shows that that is valid is that it's not just that the traditional denominations are revitalized by the evangelical movement then, but also a whole new denomination is created, and that's Methodism. Methodism, the Methodism of John Wesley, only begins in the 1730s, or to be precise, at quarter to nine in the evening on the 24th of May in 1738, the juncture of John Wesley's conversion. From then on, Methodism springs up, becomes a huge movement, by far the biggest Protestant denomination in America in the 19th century. And that movement is a novelty which expresses this evangelical spirit through and through. So I would see the 18th century as being the time when evangelicalism is, as a fresh movement, is created. Would you redefine the quadrilateral in response to some of the developments today? That actually is one of the questions from uh, one of our, our listeners. They said, would you redefine your quadrilateral in, in what you see happening in our contemporary society today? Um, in a word, no. And the reason for saying no is that just because there are developments at a particular juncture in time, it can't negate the evidence of the previous 250 years. That is to say, the evidence piles up over time, and one can look at any year between 1738 and 2022 and see these characteristics certainly in the Anglo world, but also elsewhere as the evangelical movement has spread through foreign missions and in other ways. And one can see that those characteristics are there. When that's been said, in 2023, there are novelties around us. Let, let me mention one of them that I know you're interested in, the revival at Asprey University in 2023. Now that is a, a, a revival. But that doesn't show fresh characteristics to my eyes. I've seen one or two things on the internet which show what's been going on there. And it reminds me extremely strongly of what happened in the Welsh revival in 1905. What happens at Asbury is the 
not a, a response through the stimulus of preaching, but I see developments through the local participants who tend to be students playing music and giving testimonies. And those are absolutely characteristic of the Welsh Revival at the start of the 20th century. So there are de even in what is very novel, apparently, in 2023, there is a great deal of similarity with what's gone before. Now, can one argue that one should alter the quadrilateral because of trends that have happened, not just in 2023, but in the more recent past? I take up that issue in those two books that I mentioned earlier, The Evangelical Quadrilateral, published in 2021. And those books not only have articles that I've published over the years reprinted there, but there are also introductions in which I survey the ground of how the study of evangelicalism has developed in the last 50 years or so. And I try to suggest that on the basis of the evidence that characterization in the evangelical quadrilateral does not need to be altered because it still does represent reality that other historians have seen in the past. Going back to the understanding of evangelicalism and, and how it's shaped over time, one of the things that I don't think many realize is that evangelicalism looks slightly different in the different cultural contexts in which it finds itself. Being a person who has traveled back and forth through different countries, what do you see is, let, let's just state these two areas, British evangelicals and American evangelicals, what do you see as the similarities and the differences? I would want to emphasize the similarities. I strongly believe that the movement begun in the 1730s was a movement that affected both sides of the Atlantic. That's natural. Uh, the American side would then, then consist of colonies of Great Britain. Those colonies were occupied by people who had direct correspondence with people back in Britain. When the Great Awakening first sprang up, Jonathan Edwards corresponded about it with Congregationalist members of the same denomination back in London. So th there is a very close affinity. And I do think that the movement was extraordinarily similar for the rest of the 18th century through the 19th century and to a large extent in the 20th and even the 21st centuries. I have to say, however, that there has been divergence over time. And I would see that the divergence between the movements becomes much more marked from the beginning of the 20th century onwards. In the 19th century before that, it was extraordinarily easy for people to move from one side of the Atlantic to the other and to have no, no sense of significant difference between the expressions of the evangelical movement. After the start of the 20th century, there was. When British conservative evangelicals, those who wanted to sustain the core of biblical faith, went to America in the 1920s, they were alarmed by the degree of vitriol in the fundamentalist controversy. They felt that that was not what they were used to at home. And I do think that the fundamentalist controversy being much, much more potent in the United States and parts of Canada too, meant that there was a set of different attitudes that sprang up in America, which modifies the judgment that the movements are, are one. If you want me to be specific, one of the things that I quite like doing when I go to the States is attending as many Christian services as I can and taking detailed notes. I therefore have produced um, a couple of papers um, on evangelical sermons in late 20th century Britain and evangelical sermons in early 21st century uh, America, sorry, in both cases, America. And I, I've put together my, what, what I see in those movements. I sometimes wonder what people think when they see me taking copious notes <laughs> and services, and I'm a stranger, but they're, they're, I find them extraordinarily tolerant. And I do have a large number of bits of evidence about similarities and differences there, because, of course, I do that in this country, too. What do I see as being different? I, I think one of the things that 
worries me when I go to America is that there is much less intercession in most evangelical services. That is, prayer for people not associated with the church where the service is being held, not associated with the congregation there present, but outside it. There is less prayer for events in the wider world in particular, but also events sometimes in the surrounding secular society. Now with us, intercession will be regarded as almost de rigueur. I have been to services where the has, intercession has been deficient in, in Britain, but I think it, there's a tendency for it to be left out, even at really good evangelical churches, to a far greater extent than I would wish in the States. Again, uh, I find the attitude to what some Christians of the States call the ordinances, other Christians would call them the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, is, is very much um, perfunctory. Even believers' baptism, where in churches which practice it, tends to be very brief and extraordinarily non-emphasized in Baptist and Pentecostal churches in the state. Whereas in Britain, that would be regarded as a major event and it would be emphasized and be the culmination of a, a worship service, not hidden away at the start as it tends to be in the services that I've attended. And the communion service, the Lord's Supper, is much less frequent in the States than it is in Britain, by and large. There are some, a few churches who do practice it weekly, but in Scottish Baptist churches, for example, and I am a member of a Scottish Baptist church, communion is every Sunday. Hmm. Now, that, that degree of frequency is not universal in Britain, in any denomination, although it's common in Anglican churches. Um, but the contrast is really quite striking. In the States, I feel deprived because I don't have communion very often, and, and I regret that. Now, OK, that, that's been saying, OK, America is not like Britain, and that's sad. And in those respects, I do feel that. However, there are aspects of American evangelicalism that are much, much more potent and admirable than their, their equivalents in Britain. For example, especially in the South of the States, there is a willingness to appeal to the congregation to make decisions then and there. Those appeals are not unknown in Britain, but they're very rare indeed. And I do think that there are lots of occasions when it's entirely appropriate to make appeals for people actually to submit to the yoke of Christ then and there. And I've seen that happen. I went, for example, to a uh, Native American revival service in uh, Oklahoma about 15 years ago. And that service had a Shawnee preacher who was dressed up in Indian headdress and Indi Indian um, armaments. He had shield and spear and so on. And he gave a remarkable revival address. The congregation consisted of two white people, the pastor of the church and me. Everybody else was Native American, not just Shawnees. In fact, very few of them were around there. At the end of that service, after that sermon, 13 people went forward. And OK, many of them may have been for rededication. But I'm sure that some of those were first-time commitment. Now, mm -hmm. that I find up wrong. The legacy of revivalism, therefore, is much stronger in America than it is with us. And I admire that and um, hope that what's going on at Asbury at the moment will reinvigorate that tradition and make it live over the long term. So yes, there are significant differences. And I think, as in most respects, America wins in some ways, Britain wins in others. I int intend, in fact, um, at some stage in, in my life, to try and propose the creation of a new territory in mid-Atlantic where the best of both sides of the, uh, of the Atlantic <laughs> are put into practice. And this will be true of the secular world, so that, for example, rear windshield wipers will be required in rear cars, <laughs> but also in the Christian world. And in the Christian world, there'll be lots of revivals, as well as regular communion and regular and, and more emphasis on baptism and more emphasis on intercession.
where were you in Oklahoma? I'm just curious. Surely, Oklahoma Baptist University is very kindly had me to speak on many occasions when I've been in the States. I very much appreciate their hospitality. I was there uh, back in November, uh, quite recently. And there are lots of Native Americans around there. And that is, after all, Indian territory. And I have been fascinated to go to some of the uh, former reservations and see what Christian worship there is there. On, on another occasion, for example, I was taken to a reservation only about 20 miles, I should think, out of Shawnee. And I attended a service there. And I was also told by the, the resident missionary who was part of a succession of resident evangelical Quaker mission, missionaries ever since the 1870s, that it was still his responsibility, not just to preach the gospel, but also to teach settled agricultural methods, which had been so ever since the late 19th century. He still did. The sad thing there was that about 20 years before, I think it was, some years before, anyhow, there were people on the reservation who were translating the New Testament into the language of that tribe, because the New Testament didn't exist yet in the language of that tribe. One of the missionaries actually ran over one of the children on the reservation and killed the child. And after that, all cooperation with Bible translation was stopped. So there is a tribe in the heart of the United States of America, which does not yet have the Bible in its own language. And I found that very extraordinary. What tribe is that? You know? I, I do know, and I have it in my notebooks, but I'm afraid my memory has let it escape me on this occasion. That's okay. The reason I ask that question is that my mentor was the first white man to be trained to be an Indian or Native American uh, medicine man. And then oh, he really? gave his life to Jesus. And then he dedicated his life to reaching. He called them Indians. Um, he's with Jesus now. But he worked in Oklahoma at the Native American Bible Ministries. He created a Bible camp and a Bible center. And he, more than any other person, taught me about culture. I'd never seen someone that understood how someone thought in forms that I didn't understand. Just as an example... He, he tells a story, and I've shared this before on air, where he went to a reservation and there was an old man sitting on a bench and he sat down with him and they, they sat together for eight hours and never spoke. He said the old, the old man would nod and I would nod, I would nod back and, and or he would point and I would point or, and they would nod at each other. After eight hours, the old man spoke and he said they had a pleasant conversation and, and the missionary who had been there I'm not exactly sure of the period of time, but it was maybe two years, came over and saw the conversation. And then after the conversation was done, approached my mentor and he said to him, how is it that you got that old man to speak? I, I've been here for two years and I've never got that man to say anything but good morning. And he said, you don't understand the culture. You have to wait for the older to address the younger. And so he, he he actually would tell us about sports because he took us on mission trips. He took a lot of students on mission trips to Ringold, Oklahoma. And there he, he said, they'll play you in sports, but they'll never beat you. Or I mean, they won't beat you by more than one or two points because they don't want to shame you. He said, if you play American baseball, he said, and you get two strikes and the third strike you're out, they will give you four straight balls to walk you because they don't want to shame you. So I, I learned so much about culture because he said also in America, yeah. we think, or it, white Anglos, excuse me. He said, we think in threes, they think in fours. Uh -huh. So I, I would learn just remarkable uh -huh. things about the development of the faith. And that, that leads to another part of this discussion. Well, could, 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 I, could I come in there and follow sure. that up a bit? Uh, first, there's my, my enthusiasm for thinking in fours. Clearly, all good Native Americans will accept the federal <laughs> uh, but That's a pass. <laughs> I, I have actually done some work on the Seminole tribe in particular. I wrote an article on their reception of the Christian faith through the Baptists in the 19th century a few years ago. In order to do that, I've explored Seminole life a bit because they are flourish in Seminole County, Oklahoma, which is very close to Shawnee, where I go regularly. And the library at Oklahoma Baptist University contains excellent sources, written sources for this. Um, 
the chief, in fact, of the tribe is now a Baptist minister, intriguingly, and he has he fixed up for me and my wife to go to a Seminole church to attend when we were there back in November, which we very much enjoyed. I have been to a Seminole church before that, a Baptist church, and attended the service, and I, I enjoyed its distinctive culture. I especially enjoyed seeing pegs at the back of the church and there were sticks hanging from them and it was explained to me that these were deacon sticks so the deacons could go up and down the aisles and prod people who were falling asleep during the service. <laughs> so there are distinctive features of seminole culture that i've come to terms with too i think that could usefully be applied in other churches too <laughs> <laughs> it is so you you were going to some, onto something else. Well, I mean, just as an aside there, it is fascinating to see how different cultural tra traditions just develop. At his, at my mentor's funeral, he had a, there was a blanket in the back of the sanctuary. He was from Chicago. He'd married a woman who came from a Mexican background who was Mexican, but his passion was always Native American missions. And when he passed away, they put a blanket in the back because in the specific tribes that he worked with, that's how you made your offerings is they would put a blanket and everybody would put their money on it, at least what he was affiliated with. And so I, I just found it fascinating. He, he taught me a great deal about culture and appreciation for culture, which led to a, this other part that I wanted to talk about was global evangelicalism. We see global evangelicalism exploding, exploding around the world. What are the continuities as well as the discontinuities that you see developing? And I know that's a a very hard question to parse because it differs in every cultural expression, as you've already noted, between the UK and the United States. And even within the United States, it depends on denomination, affiliation, so many different pieces. But just to paint with a broad brushstroke, what are the, the, the continuities and the discontinuities for our audience and who, who are looking at it very generally for them to see? And why should we embrace global evangelicalism or global christianity as it were sometimes when i am saddened by symptoms of the decay of the evangelical faith within great britain which i am i turn my eyes southwards and i see hope i see new movements developing um, existing churches being revitalized and many many people becoming christians and one of the remarkable things is that there has now developed reverse mission from the global south, so that in Britain, the fastest growing Pentecostal denomination is the redeemed Church of God in Christ, which is the largest Pentecostal movement in Britain now, and that began in Nigeria only in 1952, and is having an enormous impact with authentic revivals regularly taking place. So. I rejoice in the way in which the gospel is being sustained in my own country by influences from abroad. In terms of continuities, I do think that the evangelical movement in the global south is the same thing that we are familiar with in the global north. I did edit a book that came out last summer in July called The Gospel in Latin America, which is a set of lectures given at a conference under the auspices of the Evangelical Studies Programme at Bailey University, which I coordinate even when I'm not there. And that conference had various speakers, Christian and less specifically Christian speakers, talking about aspects of the historical experience of the evangelical movement in Latin America. And the collection of papers gives a very rich picture of how the movement has taken root. And it is evident from all those papers that there are emphases on Bible, cross, conversion and activism in all the evangelical movement. Those are the continuities. They're the most obvious continuities. Mm. However, there are striking discontinuities. The most obvious one in Latin America is the huge strength of Pentecostalism vis-a-vis -vis other traditional denominations. In most of the lands of Latin America, there are 
significant elements of the traditional denominations from, that is the pre-1900 denominations that we're all familiar with in the Anglo world. But the denominations that have taken root overwhelmingly, most strongly, are those of Pentecostal lineage reinforced by charismatic influences from the later 20th century. And I would see charismatic movement as being something distinct from Pentecostalism, but merging with it gradually over time. In the Pentecostal movement, <clears throat> there are the same four emphases, undoubtedly, so that the continuity is there. But the Pentecostal movement has its own distinctives, and those distinctives are apparent in many of the countries, many of the hugely growing churches in Latin America, most obviously in Brazil. And some of the emphases of those churches are on matters that lead to church growth. Others are related to politics. And I have to say that I am a little more troubled by the political side. By and large, I warm to the religious side very strongly. Uh, but the political side has various doctrines transplanted from movements in the states, which worry me a little. There's the teaching around dominion, for example. The, do the notion of dominion is what can be declared over any given area by proclamation, by the spoken word in some Pentecostal circles. And that leads to political mobilization, which I fear can sometimes be uncritical and troubling and in the longer term, detrimental to the cause of the spread of the gospel. So I have worries about some aspects of the global evangelical movement as a result actually of producing that volume on the gospel in Latin America. However, I'd want to put the emphasis where you put it on the explosion in terms of numbers. And it's not just true of Latin America, of course, it's true of Africa, that substantially Christian continent. It's true of many parts of Asia, which we often forget. In many parts of uh, northern Myanmar, um, northeastern India, there are huge Christian straight pockets of strength. Nagaland, for example. One of my favourites, Nagaland, is 85% Baptist. Now, that is a much higher statistic than in Alabama, and that's saying something. Wow. <laughs> so you have a Christian presence, not just Baptist, Presbyterians and Mizoram, enormously strong. Korea, an enormously missionary orientated Christian country. Uh, there is a remarkable degree of Christian presence in many parts of the world and it's growing. I'm very keen that that should be studied more and more, hence that volume that came out last year. I'm very keen that those who study it should transmit their message to uh, people who preach about it. I'm very keen that people should preach about it because that's a real tonic to the spirits in times of decline in the North, in the global North. I, I go to India quite a bit. And I could uh, Nagaland fascinates me because of how Baptistic it is, especially when you compare it with the rest of India. It's actually quite phenomenal. G going back for a moment, you mentioned dominion, and I would like to take this in a, a bit of a different uh, tact uh, or place. Being being a British citizen, being from the UK, seeing the developments take place across the sea, especially right now with what we see in, in, in our country, in the United States, in North America, there's the rise of Christian nationalism. And there's been a lot of discussion about it, what it is, what it does. As someone that's looking at it from a, a different cultural viewpoint, what do you see as this phenomenon? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on it? What strikes me when I go to America is how, despite the theoretical separation of church and state, it is remarkable how united religion and politics are. It is quite extraordinary. For example, when I was at Baylor University about 10 years ago, I was invited to a rally of those committed to uh, the cause of promoting life for unborn babies, if you will, an anti-abortion rally. And that anti-abortion rally was concerned with Christian things, and that was 
not surprising. Um, there were preachers there in abundance. There were hymns sung. But also, it was concerned with politics. There was a very definite message that at the next election, we must vote a certain way. Now, that degree of fusion of religion and politics is something that I am much less familiar with in the UK in the recent past. Um, it was a common phenomenon at the start of the 20th century, and indeed, people that I studied in my PhD were criticised for merging religion and politics. But I had supposed then that in America, because church and state were separate, religion and politics were separate. But no, they're not. And in some ways, that's symbolised by the very common presence in evangelical churches of the American flag. Uh, very commonly at the front, occasionally, as in one congregation that I've attended in the United States, in three places. Um, yes, at the front, also on the communion table, and also hanging down as a pendant from the ceiling above the communion table. So wherever you look frontwards, there is an American flag. Now, that does seem to me to be um, putting politics and especially commitment to nation as something which is um, more prominent than I would wish it to be as a citizen of a kingdom to come. I do believe in Christian citizenship in the present, but I do not believe that I want to have the union flag in my church. Thank you very much. Well, you do see it in some older Anglican churches, but that's precisely because of the union of church and state in, in, in England. So that, that's the paradox of the separation of church and state coexisting with the integration of religion and politics troubles me. And it troubles me mostly when the Christian faith, especially the Christian faith in the form that I would espouse, the form of evangelical religion, when that is used as a sanction for political positions that I do not necessarily concur in and support political individuals that I have not wished to support. And that is common. Mm. And so as an observer from the outside, that is my overwhelming impression. When that's been said, I have listened to many, many sermons in the States now and taken notes on them. And I very rarely in sermons hear particular political positions commended. Very rarely. I've heard it once or twice. In fact, I heard one instance where it was an assumption rather than a commendation only two months ago in December 2022 at a very conservative Baptist church where it was assumed that we would have one political allegiance. But that was an assumption and no doubt the assumption was valid and it wasn't actually preached and very, very rarely have I heard a particular political position preached. Now, I'm not saying that our church, uh, our churches in our country are innocent in this area, far from it. And I shall be supporting the coronation of King Charles III very fervently in May. I do believe in uh, our, our political system. I rather like monarchs, actually. I'm very sorry about that, but uh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I... I, I, I I don't want to say that our system's right, your system's wrong, far from it. But I'm troubled by certain contemporary developments of the Christian nationalism you speak about. Mm. How do you see that, that having attended so many churches in the United States and in the UK, and you mentioned just the sermons, how are, how are they different? And how are they the same? I know that it's it falls under the banner of the question I asked earlier, but I'm just very curious from your perspective, what do you see as the similarities and the differences? Okay, in terms of similarities, there are an astonishing number of similarities, usually related to four factors, which it would be tedious to specify. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, got but, but they are got there. They are there. they are there. They are there. I do see, as in so many aspects of life, a greater willingness in the United States to embrace recent coming contemporary cultural trends. Thus, in America, it is now almost universal to illustrate sermons, not by references to literature, which was the pattern in the past, and is still the pattern in many churches in Britain, 
but instead in America to appeal to films, allusions to that great film by, that film in which X, Y, Z happens, in which P plays that part. An enormous number of illustrations are, are related to film. And that I think is related to the way in which in our day, largely I think because of the advance of the expressivist cultural moment that I spoke of earlier, the visual is supplanting the verbal so that people are used to films as providing their cultural norms rather than novels providing their cultural expression. So uh, I do see a difference there. Now, I'm not saying that reference to films are absent in Britain. They're not. We tend to follow America's cultural trends um, at some distance, or to be precise. In London, they tend to follow American cultural trends at a short distance. And in the Western Isles of Scotland, they tend to follow those cultural trends after 50 years. There are differences of, of cultural lag within countries within ours. But there is that broad contrast. I think another broad contrast is in length. I think of the sermons that I have heard, the, there is a much greater average length in the States than there would be with us. When that's been said, my own pastor commonly preaches for more than 30 minutes, so he's an exception. But I think a survey was done fairly recently that suggested the average length of sermons in Britain was 17 minutes. The average what? in America. The average ah. in America would be, the average in America would be much longer. I'm sorry, I distress you. No, well, I, 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 I'm you. laughing because I mean <laughs> my church would would have killed for me to be at 20 minutes. I mean I was 45 minutes to 50 minutes on average. 20 there minutes, I'm still in my there introduction. So I, yeah. I I love I I love to preach and I love it I love it when a sermon goes long provided it's the content is engaging I don't want yeah. to say the yeah. length of it yeah yeah, um, yeah. one of the things that I remember hearing and I, I'd love to get your insights on this I heard some men talking who are British citizens talking about the difference in this state they were talking to an American about the difference between evangelicalism in the UK and evangelicalism in the United States and one of the comments a little bit in the same line of, of what you were saying, he said, you know, in America, many evangelicals have that political influence and political power. We lost that a long time ago. Therefore, we go about it differently now than you do and how we go about it, because the culture in which we're living in is more, he didn't say hostile, but I'm going to use that terminology, or, or not as receptive, let's say, culturally speaking. To the gospel do you find that to be true or do you think that there's needs to be a nuance on that the most important point to make in this area is the sheer difference in scale of the evangelical movements on the two sides of the atlantic in america according to professions by individuals there is a variation between something like 20 and 30 percent of the population who say they're evangelicals. Now, some of them don't go to church, which does seem rather peculiar for evangelicals. Are they evangelicals really? Well, who's to say, but they do claim to be. The equivalent figure is not 20% plus in Britain, but 2%. The evangelical community is tiny, roughly, roughly 10% of the scale of the American movement. Now, that, that's in proportion to the population. In absolute terms, of course, the American community is much, much bigger because America has a much, much larger population. So the difference numerically is hugely significant. British evangelicals cannot hope to sway public opinion on most issues at most times. The last occasion when they did was actually when Mrs. Thatcher was prime minister in 1987, when she introduced a bill into the House of Commons doing away with legislation restricting trading on Sundays. And the Sabbatarian feeling amongst the evangelicals, much stronger then than it is now, led to pressure on MPs in her own party, in the Conservative Party, to vote against. And the only occasion on which Mrs Thatcher lost a major piece of legislation when she was Prime Minister was because of an evangelical vote on that Sunday issue, which defeated her. Now, since then, there's been no significant measure 
where evangelicals have obviously had a decisive role. Clearly, evangelicals have shared with other Christians in promoting, for example, uh, the Jubilee movement, which led to the abolition of debt from certain two thirds world countries to Britain uh, at the millennium, a very significant movement. The evangelicals contributed there rather than being the decisive force, which they had been in 1987. The situation in 2023 can be illustrated by an item in this morning's newspaper. I'm speaking in February and today the, there was discussion in the newspaper of the candidates for the leadership of the Scottish National Party and therefore becoming First Minister of Scotland, a very significant role. Mm. The candidates include several people, but one of them is Kate Forbes, who is a committed member of the Free Church of Scotland and an evangelical, therefore. It is thought by some commentators in this morning's paper that that will rule her out of getting the leadership. Several commentators have acknowledged that she is head and shoulders above all other candidates. I think she is. She has been the finance minister in the Scottish cabinet for the last couple of years and done extremely well in difficult times. She's also actually a Cambridge historian, which I think is a very great virtue. So I think she has a, a, a very strong qualification for being prime minister, for being first minister. But her evangelical faith is thought to put her out of sympathy with contemporary um, Scottish cultural trends in the social sphere, and especially on gender issues. And those gender issues are now held up as a criterion of whether one can play a significant part in political leadership or not. And she is thought to fail by that criterion. Now, others are saying it's awful that um, somebody should be excluded by their belief from a position of political responsibility if they have the greatest skill, the greatest qualification. But I have a suspicion that that will prove to be uh, a decisive factor in relation to her candidacy. She is a candidate, and if she were to become leader of the party and first minister, I would be absolutely delighted, even though I don't favour the disunity of the United Kingdom. I believe in preserving Scotland as part of the United Kingdom. But I'd like to see her as leader of the SNP. But I fear that because of these issues, that's not likely to happen. So there is that marginality. Evangelicals in Britain are marginal in a way that they're not in the United States. That's the re reality. Has evangelicalism, what's been the greatest percentage of evangelicals in Great Britain at, at, at the absolute height? What would be what have what would have the percentage have been? The, the, the true answer is that nobody knows. Um, that there have been no surveys of who was an evangelical by whatever criteria that have been done officially. The nearest approximation that one can get to that is attendance at church, which is not an exact equivalent, in 1851, when there was a census run by the state of church going. It's the only time that's been done in Britain. It was abolished the following uh, the following census. But the, the 1851 census, that was done. And of the population, roughly 42% were found in church at, at, on census Sunday. And of that 42%, one can estimate that getting on for half were nonconformists who'd be overwhelmingly evangelical and a significant proportion of Anglicans would also be evangelical by that date. So of the 42%, one can say that, say, 25% of the overall population perhaps were evangelical in the middle of the 19th century. I'm pretty confident that was just about the peak of evangelical penetration of the British population. And that's virtually a quarter of the population then. So roughly the same as America is now, do you see, which is mm. interesting. But that has declined markedly over time, partly because of the advance of broad church and high church tendencies within Anglicanism, partly because of the secularization process, which would be much more drastic with us than with you. Would you count e Anglicanism as a form of evangelicalism? <laughs> 
No, I would say that within Anglicanism, there is a major evangelical party whose relative strength to the other parties, the high church and the broad church, has varied over time. In the past 50 years, under the leadership of John Stott, it has increased markedly. But even then, the population, as you said, now is what, 2% uh, of the population within the UK. But yet you refer to Prime Minister Thatcher's being her bill being defeated because of the Sabbatarians and the evangelical presence voting it down. What would have been the percentage of evangelicalism then? Um, then it was only about 2.5%. It wasn't significant. Well, it, that's, that's what, that's 20% uh, greater, but it, it was still a small proportion of the population. But what happened was that, that those individuals um, buttonholed their MPs, their members of the parliament, in order to agitate on the issue. So that, that's how it was done. What, 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 and a very important point here is that as church going numbers have fallen, evangelicals as a proportion of Anglicans has increased, and evangelicals as a proportion of the church going population as a whole has increased. So that the churches are more sympathetic to evangelicalism now than they were 50 years ago, even though the population at large isn't. Is that rise due to the global influence of those countries that have been commonwealths or like Nigeria? I know you mentioned the rise of Pentecostalism. I remember hearing an urban missiologist, a man by the name of Ray Baki, years ago. He's with Jesus now. He, he would refer to this phenomenon going on where so many evangelicals and Christians were coming from other parts of the world, of the, of the United Kingdom, and coming back to Great Britain and bringing a form of revival or at least a resurgence, renewal of some aspect. Is that what we're seeing today or what you're seeing in the UK? Yes, uh, largely yes. Uh, it has been true for over a decade that a majority of churchgoers in London are black. A very large number are either themselves immigrants or descended from immigrants since the Second World War. And some of them are from Jamaica, significant proportion from Jamaica. But in the more recent past, a very high proportion have come from Nigeria. And they have some of the strongest churches in London, but also spreading throughout the country. So that, yes, that's got a lot to do with it. It also has to be said that there are lots of um, non-traditional groups who are founding small evangelical causes in many places up and down the country. These are churches that would have once have been called house churches. By and large, they're charismatic. By and large, they have young people as a significant proportion. They come and go. They, they tend to rise and fall with individual pastors. But there are a significant number of house churches. For example, a survey was done in the city of York about 10 years ago now, which showed that there were more people attending on a given Sunday, that type of evangelical house church. There were more people in those house churches than there were in Anglican churches in York, a cathedral city. And th that type of small house church is very common and is not known about by the press and the other media. So the Christian presence is actually stronger than most official statistics and most official perceptions would suggest. But it is um, not in a position to exert strong social influence by and large, let alone political influence. At least not yet. But if that trend continues, it should. Uh, that is true. Um, however, it has to be said that... The trend is not, as it were, um, firmly in place because a lot of the trends suggest that a high proportion of evangelicals, as of other Christian groups, are in the older age bracket. Now, I'm not entirely unsympathetic with that because I quite like the older age bracket myself. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, you can't be confident that the growth in the, for example, regime Christian Church of God that I mentioned before, you can't be confident that that will continue to grow um, 
much bigger. It, its chief allegiance has been amongst the Nigerian population, the, the ex-Nigerian population, those who have come to this country. And how far it will make the transition to getting a substantial proportion of the population who are native born, as it were, is yet to be seen. So I think the, the, the jury's out on that. Do you think that uh, Pentecostalism is the form of Christianity going forward that would become the, I mean, they're already the, the fastest growing movement. And and can you just for a, give us for a, 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 an armchair definition, if you will, the difference between a Pentecostal and a charismatic? Because you said there was a differentiation between the, the de, you mentioned the Pentecostal denomination, but you mentioned a charismatic group and you separated those two. Forgive me if I didn't articulate that correctly, but can you explain that? I would want to differentiate between classic Pentecostalism that began at the start of the 20th century in America, Britain and elsewhere, and the charismatic renewal movement that became a significant force in the 1960s. Pentecostal movement was very strongly denominational and very strongly committed to traditional evangelical shibboleths. For example, uh, abstinence from alcohol, for example, observance of Sunday. Charismatics were, yes, overwhelmingly evangelical, but not all. Many charismatics were Roman Catholic or Anglo-Catholic and some broad church people with the, with the Anglican church. So they didn't have the same denominational allegiance, but they certainly didn't have the adherence to traditional social attitudes, which one can sum up by that word shibboleths. By and large, charismatics had no hang-ups about alcohol and no insistence on subitarianism. Indeed, they tended to glory in their freedom from both. And that meant that they had a much more flexible attitude to life in general. Furthermore, whereas the theological convictions of traditional Pentecostals had crystallized and were often defined in their theological statements of faith. Charismatics did not believe in that. They believed that truth is mobile and can often change over time, and they actually said that, and um, did not want to be bound certainly by the particular emphases. For example, the emphasis of several Pentecostal denominations in the States and Britain and elsewhere on the essentiality of speaking in tongues as a sign of the baptism of the Spirit. Uh, that was never insisted on by charismatics. However, I would want to say that in many parts of the world, there has been a merger, a fusion of the two, because they clearly have an affinity in believing, for example, in glossolalia. So that in Australia, the two strands have become totally merged and are, are a single thrust now. The, the, institutionally, the charismatic movement has been absorbed by, not wholly absorbed by, but a substantial part of it absorbed by the Pentecostals, and together they're a vi very vigorous force. Um, so uh, although in origin they are very distinct, and I've argued this in print, they have come together, especially during the 1990s, and are very much more of a united force now in the 21st century. I do think, yes, that they have an enormous future, partly because of the natural affinity of some Pentecostal expectations with those of um, traditional groups, whether in Latin America, Africa, Asia, or wherever, uh, about what religion is. The sense of the supernatural is much more strongly embedded in many continents other than those of the global north, and therefore the sense that um, religion of a super a strongly supernatural kind such as Pentecostalism is uh, is a natural thing to move to from traditional beliefs so yes I, and, and to me many Pentecostals in India for example that you've mentioned are very prepared to sacrifice themselves for their faith the Pentecostal missions in India certainly don't hide their light under a bushel as I'm sure you, you will know better than I and it's self-sacrificing uh, defense of the faith that spread the church in the first, second, and third centuries. It's likely to do so in the 21st century too.
So taking that into consideration, what do you see then, and let's start with the obstacles as well as the the hope. What what are the what are the I guess not the obstacles, what are the fears that you have going forward that you see or threats to the church going forward right now? There are in the present day lots of potentials for schism over gender issues. We've mentioned the condition of the United Methodist Church in America at the moment. And I think a lot of Christian energy can go into fighting your side in splits, which should be going into more obvious spreading of the gospel. I think that's one risk. I think another risk is emphasizing experience as some Pentecostals would, to the denigration of theology. And I think that risk is there because, all the, all the more there in our day, because of the shift from the emphasis on the verbal to the visual that I've mentioned, which is part of the broad cultural trend in Western civilization in our day. If you don't want to emphasize the verbal, you may think that doctrine is unimportant. And I'm troubled by many Christian bookstores in this country, and some I've seen in the States, though by no means all, where there are lots of books on Christian living and none on Christian theology. That worries me a very great deal for the future. Theology is important for the well-being of the church. In terms of threats, clearly major threats to the Christian faith come from the state. And in many parts of the world in our day, the state is very hostile to the Christian church. That would be true in many parts of the Muslim world. Still, technically, Christians are not allowed to worship in Saudi Arabia. It's simply not allowed, but it does happen, of course, in private. And there are other countries where, according to official statistics kept, especially in the States, religious freedom does is tending on a downward course rather than an upward course. There is also the risk from state authorities which favour one particular expression of faith rather than another. And that is probably most obvious in contemporary Russia, where there is an extraordinary fusion between the policies and stance of the government headed by President Putin and the stance of the Russian Orthodox Church under its patriarch Kirill. Um, I heard a paper on that at a conference only last month, which showed the intertwining is very, very strong. And hence, other Christian denominations, most obviously evangelical denominations, are regarded as marginal and often unpatriotic. And that is going on in contemporary Russia. That can happen as well in China, of course, despite the enormous growth of the church in China over the past half century. And it can happen elsewhere too. There is always a threat to the Christian church from the state. The state is depicted in Revelation as a danger to the church. It is like the, the, the symbol of Babylon is always there and it's over against the church. And that is true in our day. So there, there are some of the things that I think are troublesome. The, the advantages of the church are, of course, those that Christian leaders, Christian preachers have always emphasized. Um, God is with us. Uh, the truth is, is strong and will prevail. And I do believe that. I believe that the Holy Spirit, God himself, is in the church and empowering the church. And that means that there is growth even in very difficult parts of the world in our day, often at its most effective in the most difficult parts of the world, because it is still true. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Mm. Hmm. One final thought as we conclude our time. What what is the subject that you that most piques your interest right now that you want to write about or are writing about? As I've implied by talking about my wife's biography, uh, my wife um, interacts with my academic activities quite strongly. She has been prodding me from some for some years to write a popular book. I don't actually believe in writing popular books, but she wants me to write a popular book 
on why there are so many denominations in the Anglo-American world. I do find denominations, whether big churches or tiny sects, fascinating. And I've developed a degree of reading on many of them over the years, and she wants me to set this down in a book. So when we were at Bailey University last semester, she sat me down and insisted on taking dictation from me without my doing any preparation on the various Christian traditions that have marked the world over the last, um, since the Reformation. So I tried to do that and she produced a typed up skeleton of, of chapters for this book, about 25 of them. So I now have skeletons on lots of traditions from Anabaptists to Tridentine Roman Catholics and everything in between, innumerable branches of obscure evangelicals who I really like digging out. Um, and I'm trying now to clothe those skeletons in flesh. And that is something that I am quite keen on doing. My wife's even keener, so I'm constantly prodded about that every evening. <laughs> well, I look forward to reading that when that comes out. This has been an absolute delight to pick your brain to, to, and having read your works, I mean, I didn't even get into one of the parts that I actually had a question about in the domination of evangelicalism was the understanding of entertainment by evangelicals or their their attitude toward entertainment at the beginning of the 20th century and to where they're at now i mean that's a whole nother subject just because i think that's something that many people are into but anyway thank you again for coming on the show how can people learn more about you i mean besides your books which are 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 everywhere um how can people learn more about what you're doing and follow along well, I, I'm sorry to say, but I would recommend my wife's biography, which tells, <laughs> tells people about who I am. Um, if people want to read about some of my central convictions, then they will find those two books that I've spoken of on the Evangelical Quadrilateral, produced in 2021 by Bailey University Press, uh, are, are worth reading. Another thing they might like to look out for is conferences that we hold every year under the auspice of the Evangelical Studies Program at Bailey University. There isn't anything on the website at the moment about next year's, but there will be a conference at the start of October on international evangelicalism with papers by people from many parts of the world, which will produce a book eventually. And this is an annual conference, so they, they might like to look for that, the website. Um, I think information about that conference will go up um, certainly by May. The conference takes place in October. And they'll find out about some of my concerns through that because I do act as coordinator, invite the speakers and suggest their topics. So that's another way in which they can keep up to date with my thoughts such as they are. Well, so. I want to, I, I recommend that wholeheartedly to everyone who's listening or watching this online and, and hope to have you back again. I feel like we're just starting to scratch <sighs> the surface of so many yeah. different things. I, I, I thoroughly enjoy having this conversation to be able to dialogue about these very important issues about where we've been and where we're going. So thank you. What I you. would say on that is you cannot understand where we're going unless you know where we've been. So I totally agree. Read, everybody must read lots more history. That's right. Good. And that's what, right. one of the reasons why we exist. That's one of the reasons why we exist. So thank you again for coming on Apollos Watered. Thank you.